Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us for our next installment of our Creative Forces event. We are joined today, of course, by Claudio Miranda, who is a Chilean cinematographer, best known as the Academy Award-winning director of photography for Ang Lee's Life of Pi, as well as a director of photography on David Fincher's film, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. His other credits include Oblivion, Tomorrowland, Tron Legacy, Only the Brave, and most recently, Top Gun Maverick. We're also joined today by Ian McCausland from our LA office. He will be uh, moder moderating all of the questions coming from our YouTube audience. So please go ahead and type all those questions that you have for Claudio in, and we'll make sure we get them in front of him to answer for you guys. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Claudio Miranda. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I really think of you as a DP that really likes to try to push the envelope when it comes to technologies. Uh, so I would love to sort of pick your brain a little bit as to how you, you know, when you design a look when you're working with a, a director, when you're reading a script, uh, how you sort of go through that process and come up with the right camera and lens package. Uh, so maybe we'll start kind of at the beginning, you know, even with movies like uh, Curious Case of Benjamin Button, uh, very VFX heavy project, groundbreaking really at the time. We now think of de-aging as not really that big of a deal, right, with all the, you know, recent developments uh, with technology. But back then it was certainly groundbreaking. So can you talk a little bit about that and, you know, your, your sort of experiences? Because you're shooting with uh, digital cinema cameras at the time, correct? It was, uh, you said, I think you said it was Vipers and Sony F23s? It was Viper in the beginning and then we just had some issues with some sound that the Vipers are very loud when we had these really quiet scenes. So for the hospital scene, we flipped to F23 mainly just because it was a quieter camera and we didn't mind that it having a different look to it. So that whole movie has a cycle, you know, going back from the past where we had this warm and smoky environment and we kind of clean it up and get sometimes a little bit less romantic with the look. You know, for instance, there's this, a scene in the train station where um, I have, you know, glorious light coming through the windows and it's very shafty and smoky and beautiful. And then, you know, Fincher and I were talking about and just saying, we want to make this modern look kind of really depressing. Like the station is just, you know, it's got a digital clock up instead of the old, you know, analog clock. And I just sort of threw up this suggestion, let's just turn on the house lights that were on stage. And I just turned on the house lights on stage and that was the shitty modern look that we had, you know? <laughs> we looked at it that that lot looks crappy and depressing and we just went with that um oh, that's great um did you when you um you'll know, speak to directors or when you're looking at a script what other considerations do you have when it comes to like the type of equipment or how you kind of decipher that look uh as per project basis well i do want to fight figure out you know, what we're doing, you know, I mean, what is the project? The Tron had a very electronic feel, obviously, to the, to, the, to the story. So I didn't mind being, you know, electronic on that version, even though the original was shot film, but to a very, oh my God. If you see the making of that, that's pretty intense, how they made that movie and committed to those looks. But um, we had the luxury of shooting. We also, we had, we were shooting in uh, native three-dimensional. So um, that definitely had, uh, a consideration for a real 3D. Um, and, uh, you know, at that time, I don't think 3D was that up to par. There was, um, there's definitely perspective lines that I thought, you know, you couldn't do in stages as far as three-dimensional. I had different thoughts about 3D, about uh, shallow depth of field. Everyone was reading the book and says, you must have infinite depth of field. And I agree to a point, but I disagree to another point. I, be, I believe that if your eyes engaged in an actor, um, I feel that it's more immersive if the background's just a little bit soft and you're engaged specifically on that actor. So I think the story point to depth of field, and I, you know, I believe that in storytelling, even should today, I think there's there's times when you do want larger depth of field for a story point, and then you really, at a point, it's really dramatic to shallow it up for, you know, an intimate scene or. Or, or whatever you feel like is a story. So for me, gear-wise, it's all about like how I feel I want to tell the story. Great. Uh, yeah, so uh, Tron being 3D, um, that's in, that is interesting because like you said, most, most common practices at the time was that with 3D work, you need to have a very great depth of field and you don't want to have necessarily a shadow. So was that a challenge, uh, sort of convincing everyone that, that that's the way you thought you should proceed with 
with this? No, it's like everything else. I don't, I don't surprise everybody. You know, I go like, hey, we're shallow now. You know, I, you know, I do tests. I do camera tests. And um, you'll, you'll see some of the ridiculous ones I've done, you know, that, are, that I think some pictures have been taken. Um, and I just feel like, you know, when, we, when we're shooting, we know, we're, you know, we know the, what we're feeling. I'm not going to surprise everyone and go shallow depth of field. I just say, I'll just do a close-up. For instance, there's one of Je uh, Jeff Bridges. He's sitting on the thing, and it's super shallow. It's, uh, you know, quarter inch depth of field, and it's totally appropriate for that moment. Um, and also, we were also dealing with other impracticalities just to kind of let me to need light as well. The suits were only so bright, and I was, they were all electrified suits. So I wanted to get as much light off them as possible. So I also used those suits also in some scenes actually light each other. Um, there's a couple scenes I think you might have, I think that might be in the play as well, that shows kind of how they light each other. Uh, you mean one of the images that we, that you sent us? Uh, might be in this, uh, might be, uh, initially starts with a blue screen background and then it kind of, um, it tracks along to where they're in a hallway. Uh, you may not need uh, to do the beginning of it. You've, you could probably just fast forward a little bit through this and yeah, I'll just yeah. show you like this is kind of the raw of the suits being kind of lit, but this is where I was talking to the actors. I say, they initially had their hands you know, across their shoulders. I said, I really need to use the light to light each other. So right now the suits are definitely lighting uh, Olivia Wilde and Garrett Hedlund too. So it's, uh, I didn't know another place to put a light that felt realistically. I didn't think it'd be a nice three quarter back anywhere. It'd be in shot. It just, it'd feel wrong and disconnected. So I think the shot, this is the way it was in camera. And of course, every now and I think this clip shows the, the suit going off, which was, we had to kind of fix or, or cut cut between. Anyway. Oh, the, uh, the EL wires in the suit, you mean? <laughs> the EL wires. And they, you know, and you know, Garrett, you know, he's, you know, when he was doing some action scenes, he sweated a lot and he was constantly cursing at the screens, getting electrocuted half the time, you know. There was a lot of voltage in there for him. Anyway. Great. And then um, you also sent us a clip also with, uh, I believe he's your uh, gaffer uh, playing with LED lighting. And maybe that was kind of the early onset of really high end LED lighting for your uh, for, you know, future films, too, as well. Right. Yeah, there was a you know, there's a definite point in the story where he holds up the, um, okay, kind of the disc into the air well. and, um, you know, he sends it off. And that's, you know, the iconic movie of uh, iconic imagery of the first one and i kind of wanted to have an iconic imagery of the second one and i definitely nice wanted to make this 30 foot tall by six foot wide led wall that had great. motion in it that kind of was giving the feeling of the disc porthole so i did make a oh, this so was just a temp size one but for the uh for the shoot day we i made but this is what i was showing you know what i wanted to build yeah. and uh joe kaczynski was all excited about doing this in camera so i built a uh, I think it was, I think it was eight foot wide by 50 foot tall uh, version of that with just media flowing around for interactive light. And then I used them for elevators for, you know, Tron elevators go very fast down and up. So there's definitely, I, I use those for interactive lighting uh, for disc games as well. For when discs are flying around actors, I would put like panels across and have the light of the disc kind of surround the actors. I just felt it was much more immersive to have the technology kind of the lighting kind of flow around the actors but this felt more i try to make it as real as possible like in tron you know we built that one room that i think you showed a picture of earlier on and we just we just love that you know the idea is they're touching and it's real obviously there's background extensions and you know tron bikes don't work that fast and uh, so there's a couple <laughs> things that we had to do you know right yeah, I think those are the early photos we have on the screen of the kind of the white floor and uh, sort of you see the fading distance. Um, I mean, that's a real point. set. I mean, that's beautiful, you know, I think. Um, all those glass panels were unfortunately different colors, which, uh, you know, it was just, I don't know why they came and it was a big torture to get it as close as it is right now, which I still think I would fix it. But that's just me. Oh, you mean the actual glass material itself came from the factory? Oh, all the glasses different were different colors. They were green, magenta. I don't know what happened, but they were all like, some were stacked with plus screen, some were stacked with minus screen and different levels. And they're just, you know, we just tagged each one and I just, 
it was like a week getting that floor balanced to be the right thing. And, and it was built awesome. nine feet in the air so I could underlight it. And, and also I wanted cues to bring the whole thing on as well. So anyway, a lot of work. Uh, so yeah, actually the gel individual glass sheets are probably what, two feet by two feet it looks like, if not bigger. Uh, the end of each, each section was um, sectioned off. So the lights that were lighting had their own little package specific to the corrections that needed to be done. Uh, that's really anyway, cool. that's yeah. not that's that's a that's more of a boring conversation about underlighting glass, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> it was it was a little bit Joe's kind of, you know, he's wearing his Kubrick Schmerbick T-shirt, you know, on that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely an interesting look. Thank you for that insight. Um, sorry, was that Ian coming with the question? I thought I heard his voice. No, we're all good. I'll, okay. I'll entertain a question anytime you're ready, guys. Yeah, if you had some anything specifically about, since we're talking about Tron, if there's a Tron legacy specific question, be happy to to hear that now. Uh, again, that may have just been some feedback in my earpiece here. Nothing for Tron specifically at this time. Thank you. Sure. But yeah, uh, as a reminder, please go ahead and ask those questions, and uh, you know we'll have Ian interrupt us uh, when when you know we get started talking. Um, you know, we wanted to briefly also talk, of, of course, we can't talk to Claudia Miranda and not talk about uh, when you won the Academy Award for Life of Pi. Uh, so that was an interesting project because, strictly speaking, not strictly speaking, but much of the film was shot on in a water tank or at least right. in body of water. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not just as simple as filling um, a pool or, you know, uh, flooding a parking lot full of water. But you actually had to build a dedicated uh, tank for this, correct? Yes, we built a dedicated tank, um, and it had to satisfy our lighting needs for the movie. You know, it had to, you know, sunset to sunrise. It had to be large enough volume that I felt like I could put a sun from, which was a large sun. I think it was, uh, I think we had nine M18s on it on a crane rig to to throw li uh, water uh, light across this water, and we had. Um, uh, the overheads, we had a system of rags that we could block out the sun or use real sun. Um, the rags were three of them that I think were 150 by, what were they? It was three and a foot long, the whole tank that we covered. And I think it was 150 feet. I think it was more than that. Anyway, it was about 150 feet. And then it was, we were able to put blacks, um, full grid, quarter grid, and sometimes I... I just changed the way I want the lighting. Like if I wanted a little bit more softer glow from the back, I'd black up some of the ones near camera and I'd, I'd put full grid in the back and it kind of gave us this sunset feel or this past sunlight feel. Um, so you could see kind of how we were working. We had a 3D rig on a spider cam. That's kind of in the pictures. Um, there's a lot of science kind of to this uh, tank. It was uh, wave engineers kind of build this tank. Um, there's some of these tripods that stop the backwash of water so the waves can kind of feel more oceanic. Um, I had, you could see there's uh, white rags that I could pull to give a little bit more fill or, or black, depending if I want more contrast. Um, yeah, that was the tank work. I mean, we also had, you know, some other kind of interesting shots on there as well, which I thought was we had this, uh, this pool in India that was this uh, scene where it was a celeb it was a, um, a festival of, of some sorts. I, I don't know why I'm actually forgetting what it was for. Um, but we needed, Ang wanted to fill it with candles. So I thought it was very interesting to have on my my list of orders for the, for the gaffer and for the crew, well, actually more for the production designer for like 120,000 candles, which was, it was quite a beautiful thing seeing two people light them and I was lighting them. The producers were lighting them. It was just, it was a really magical day. Um, my gaffer did, you can see on the top picture, there was a little light that was kind of there because I was maybe worried that the candles were there. But in the end, I just kind of kept on turning them off and just letting the candles really just light the scene. All, all the candles that we had. It was a, it was a pretty beautiful um, yeah. scene. And on the, there's also the picture, th that's a tank picture too, which is kind of like the book cover. And that was kind of, a, that's what a real tank looked like in the lighting uh, of that tank, which I thought the sun felt really believable. Um, I think it has a, I think it works really well. 
So you can literally say 120,000 foot candles or whatever the, the units oh. of. <laughs> yeah, there's 120,000 <laughs> candles per foot. <laughs> what I kind of was calculating out. So anyway. Uh, that's um, interesting. And then as far as the tank build, uh, you also sent us an image of the the construction and then you, you put, you know, based on the time of the year, of course, the shadow and the Earth's rotation and everything would affect that. So can you get into this image a little bit too? Because this I thought this was pretty oh, fascinating. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it actually plays, but um, also, well, I think you could hit play on this. Uh, it just actually showed, I wanted the doors to open from the tank. So I built these these giant doors that could open and they were, it was facing the sunset, basically facing west. So at a certain time of day, I would use the real sunset to, you know, cause I just tried to use as much real light as possible. For me, it, it's always, it's always the best. So um, I devised these doors to open and we, for one scene, we, we opened them up and uh, obviously scenes, when you get into a big scene, they, they take more than a couple hours to shoot. So on those scenes where I had to maintain sunset, it was, um, I, for those we, you know, I had to use fake sun. Hey, Jeff, um, we have a question. Uh, sorry, sure, go ahead, please. Uh, this is in regards to the conversation we're having about the technical challenges. Uh, Mauricio Vidal's asking, in projects like Oblivion, Life of Pi, or Benjamin Button, all those have technical innovations involved. How do you manage your time and make artistic and technical decisions? Do you determine the visual language and style of the film first and then technical developments to be made? And what happens when technical developments take longer than expected? Well, I mean, for Oblivion, that might be kind of a later conversation. I don't know if you want to go and uh, do you want to go into that now? Jeff, or? Well, I know we want to speak about Oblivion definitely in, in some okay. detail, but uh, there was also a point about the question about, you know, Life of Pi and other technical uh, points too. So do you, you want to address at least those challenges first? Well, or? I mean, you could, we could talk about like how I got the job, you know, in a way. I mean, I got the job because Ang Lee wanted to shoot digital. Um, Ang Lee wanted to shoot in 3D. So he liked the way Benjamin Buttons looked and he liked the three-dimensional of Tron. So that was kind of a those two movies kind of got me in the door. And when I met Ang, I actually, I do usually really terrible in interviews. Um, I don't know what it is. I usually, you know, in the beginning I didn't get jobs, but now, now they seem to be a little bit more better. But in the beginning I just, and I thought for sure, when I walked away from that job, I thought for sure I lost it. Um, then they gave me a call and says, Ang wants to meet you on stage. So I went on the stage and they had some 3D and Ang's going like, this 3D just feels kind of, uncomfortable or or backwards and I just spent I just went up to the cameras and just kind of set up the scene and in literally like five minutes I just showed him like a better version of the of it and he just and I kind of had to go for another meeting for something else and then I got a call that I had the job you know <laughs> just after that you know so I was like wow I finally got a job you know like after an interview you know I mean, and that's actually probably a good segue to, we might as well talk about Oblivion, because I think, uh, one of my favorite movies, by the way, but I think the um, the beauty of it, and, and this is, folks may know this already, but I think the beauty of it is when they're in the, uh, what do they call it, the sky? Uh, sky Tower, yeah. Thank you, Sky Tower. That all of the lighting within that tower is actually essentially practical, because it's coming from front projection, and I think you, you said, probably a dozen or maybe even more like two dozen projectors in a stitched gigantic wall. Right. Um, and that would provide a lot of the lighting for that. So can you talk a little bit about that process and even just where the genesis of that project, how did that come about or that idea rather the, uh, using the sky tower lighting? Um, I mean, for me, Joe and I, after Tron, we, we did Tron together. We always imagined in like a world that had, you know, maybe led at the time, but, when we looked at the sets, the sets were so big. And at the time, LED had this terrible off angle. Things get very magenta when you get to the sides. I mean, it's still present to this day, but screens have gotten, it's progressed a lot farther, which makes it much easier to use um, the LED technology. Um, for me, uh, 
I worked in uh, some modeling programs um, to figure out the screens and if this would work. And I kind of pre-visualized lighting from using 3D to see how it would, from the camera angles. Also, I had to kind of place the set. Um, so we had to place the set. I think it kind of worked out from our angles that it had to be nine feet off the ground. So I didn't see the ceiling or the floor and I had to move in the screen um, enough where I wouldn't see the floor or the grid at, the, at that point. So it was all carefully mapped. What you kind of see in these, these images right now is projection overlap. So you can see a lot of projections are kind of mounted you know, vertically and there's a four that were mounted horizontally that covered the space. Um, I think in the end we had a lot more projectors, but we had a single piece of cloth brought in, I think from Germany, that was 45 feet tall by 500. And it was a continuous piece of fabric that wrapped the whole set. Um, and, you know, I did get a lot of, um, uh, let's say production wasn't, I, let's say, how can I say this without getting in too much trouble? But they weren't totally on board. Uh, they were, you know, I got a, a quote was saying, I think this plays too, if you want to see it. This is uh, just a lighting uh, thing. This should actually play this clip. Um, this is just, I was just showing me how, it, you know, where to place the sun. How does it look? Does it look far? You know, the worst thing is when I, I see a movie and the sun looks like it's, it does a V. It doesn't look like lines are parallel. So I wanted to make sure this, the sun was deep enough where I wouldn't see, um, where the lines would not be parallel. So this was a little bit of some, Testing I've done. This is just a, a play. This is this is a little bit fancier version of of uh, of just kind of the mythology. But they were really into you know shooting at blue screen, and I it was a big convince to kind of convince them that um, to to build this kind of projection model. Um, they didn't. Uh, we did some tests, and we did a you know two projectors on a tiny set, and we said, wow, this is really has some potential and they, but they still weren't they still weren't buying it I, I mean i really had to kind of stick my neck out there and just and joe backed me up on this too which is kind of great um that no we're we're committing to this and um i think we gave the guy you know i think it was like a two-week build and i gave him an extra pad and they ate through the pad and we were still fixing things on the shoot day it was one of the moments I think in my career, which I think was the biggest, because it was so much, so many people kind of not supporting it, that I had the most, um, I don't know, euphoric kind of, yeah, <laughs> you know, when it all worked and worked beyond beyond our our wildest thoughts we thought it was only going to be good for medium shots but we used it for wide shots um we lit completely with it um i mean every now and then i would put a little bounce somewhere in the, in the frame if i needed to but the shot you're seeing now is just all projection no other augmented lighting um you know i had to argue that i said listen all the lights that i'd light the blue screen up i'm not going to have it i'm going to have a really small lighting package it's going to be the lighting package will be nothing you know and uh i had to i had to kind of commit to that so like one of your little battles and fights to kind of um make this happen and uh you know and, and it was also because we we wanted all the surface to be chrome and glass and you know that kind of what that's what the, the space kind of needed it needed to be made with all these high-tech materials. And if all those surfaces would be made out of dulled gray or, and then they, they would have to add reflections in and it'd be all synthetic, it, it would, I think it'd be terrible. And I turned it uh, blue uh, for the producers, uh, just threw a video blue on the whole thing and the whole set disappeared. Um, yeah, so it was a good win, that one. That was our, that looked great. I was pretty proud of that, that day. That was, that was, Amazing, amazing set. Yeah, it's obviously the it's a beautiful look uh, that you've created as well, and and that was essentially um, all footage that you guys went out to some mountains in Hawaii, I believe, right? And you shot some practicals and then just reprojected them uh, with the stitched 
So. Yeah, they sent a, we sent a camera crew out there, and they just we wanted them to get above the clouds, so they were just they see the clouds and they're just running up. I think it was Jonas Stedman when was my you know my AC, and he was just they were just hoofing it up, you know, the mountains at these high altitudes to get the the perfect plates of of uh, the sky that we kind of we we put on the projection. I mean, obviously in the story there's a blown up moon, so they have to you know. We, we they add that to our plates as well, right? And of course, there's also a really classic scene uh, where Tom Cruise's character is rappelling into this uh, sort of mountain cavern, right? And that's all right, that, right? And yeah. uh, I think you have a couple images of that too. Yeah, we we did. There were some lighting references that I wanted to do. I really wanted the light to feel like it came from the hole and it kind of radiated out from that point. And then as Tom gets kind of when he gets lower, boomed down into the environment, I really wanted to be his flashlight they had on the end of the gun, along with some grips holding whites up, you know, and kind of chasing him around a little bit and just have little spots of white where he can kind of hit every now and then. That would be his only return. So this was kind of a previs model. I just, I just roughed in a little bit of a lighting thing, how I wanted it to feel. And then I think, I think if the, the next clip on this one just shows kind of what reality was. Right, so this is previs, what we're looking at right now, and then this you have kind of this, a, a very rough previs, and then I think this, I just play this one, and this is kind of the you know our lighting test reality. This was kind of how right, it so this was the end result. This was the end result, and what I did on that one because we didn't have enough um, ceiling room, we only had eight feet. What I built is a uh, giant eight by twelve. Um, polished like a, a piece of silver and I had three 18 Ks 50 feet at the back wall aiming at the top bouncing into it so it gave it a more collimated look so it didn't feel saucy so it, it gave a it gave it a better shaft you know just to throw that kind of light from eight feet especially if I have to hang it then the lights hanging down four feet away from the ceiling um, that's a little bit of a mess so uh, I just think that that would look fake. So that's why we just came out with this giant um, silver bounce. So was that the main source? I'm sorry if you said that already. That was the main source. Well, along with Tom's flashlight on his gun when we got into the scene, when he, he crossed the bridge and uh, went to the other side, the darker side of the, um, of the set. Yeah, I think we actually have a uh, still of that. So when this clip finishes, we'll see the actual... Uh set of him rappelling in with the flashlight, like you said, lighting up this, uh, I think it was a library, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's, it's the New York Library. You right. know, it's supposed to be the destruction of the... But you can see, like, in the very back, it gets pretty bleak. You can probably go to the next frame. I think this is just long, and long enough there. Yeah, that's, I think these are some stills that, uh, that were taken. So obviously some great atmosphere uh, coming from that, you know, like you said, essentially two light sources. Correct. And I do want his, his gun to be, you know, prominent light in this as well. So we did, you know, test different lights for the guns and we, you know, found one way that would, that would work within the confines of the, of the flashlight. Right. Cool. And then, uh, you know, I think your next project after that was probably Tomorrowland, which was the, for those that don't know, the first uh, Dolby Cinema release, uh, so HDR uh, release. Uh, you know, and I think these days maybe a lot of us take HDR for granted because it's become really easy and accessible where a lot of TVs support it, your latest phones and tablets all support HDR, but you were, again, instrumental in sort of paving the way for the HDR landscape. Uh, so what was it like when, when you got the call for Tomorrowland and they said, we want to shoot this in HDR? Or maybe I should back up and ask the question, did they begin thinking they wanted to finish this in HDR and Dolby Cinema, or did that come later? It came later. It came a little after the fact, you know what I mean? So it wasn't really planned uh, for HDR. There's There was some issues with certain scenes in HDR that became uh, problematic. I mean, any time you have, because we'd live in a, you know, 24 frame kind of world in, in there. Anytime you have high high strobing with high brights and likes becomes a little bit problematic. So we had to kind of do a special grade for that one just to kind of calm that down it, because it just becomes a little bit, a little bit too much. So 
a lot of people like to, which is a problematic in the industry, I think sometimes movies or some television shows are just kind of given a lot to kind of convert one way or the other direction. But I do believe that there has to be a thought process to the way you grade HDR and a thought process to how you grade the 14 foot Lambert cinema version and the process of how you just do regular uh, home uh, video release, whether it's HDR or not. I just think there has to be a conscious, there's not a one button turnkey that this kind of goes, that a machine, a device that kind of makes it, I mean, they, they, they sell them. I just don't, I just think it, it's, there's a story point. I mean, in Tomorrowland, you know, to make the sun 100% or make the whites 100% is just painful. You know, we don't, you don't want to live in a world that that does that. But where there's an explosion or, you know, uh, you know, in, um, uh, what am I just for drawing a back on the, on the name of the um, film? But on Close Encounters, that big, bright white screen, you could use that for a big bass drum, which would be, I think that'd be fantastic. So there's a place to use all that range you do have, but I just don't think now that you have whites at this, you know, incredible brightness, I just don't think that's where white should live a hundred percent of the time. And I think it has to be done with people with taste. Jeff, we have a question in regards to that. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, Maddox Upshaw is asking Claudia if he uses a LUT for exposure or do you uh, rely to do that in post? In other words, how uh, reliant are you on a LUT to judge exposure on set versus setting everything in terms of luminance and color in post? Uh, I know I'll be there in the DI, so I just make sure that I'm capturing the dynamic range of the camera, you know, from sun as much as, you know, and putting my exposure where I want it. I mean, I look at uh, waveforms, uh, I don't really do a bunch of LUTs on a on a on a film. Pretty much, I have one LUT for the whole show. I base all. I just change my. If I want it warmer, I might just do a color temperature shift, or I just, you know, change how I light, you know, uh, to make it look right for the movie. Um, but for me, I don't. I've seen a lot of people do it where they have all these different LUTs. Uh, I'd rather not. Um, I may sit with the DITF and I say grab some specific frames for the editorial and I'll go and I'll make a specific look for that scene and I'll and then that'll be applied to the dailies going forward from there. But nothing beats I, I know I'm going to be in the in DI like I was yesterday uh, <laughs> on on my latest movie, you know, and I'm going to be there in the room and we're going to talk about color, warmth, contrast. Um, you know, we're doing the 14 foot Lambert version now. Uh, I'm sure we'll uh, be doing an HDR pass after the fact, you know, Dolby. And then there's IMAX uh, version. Then there's, um, and then there's even some other formats that are coming out that I'm not sure if I could talk about. And a related <laughs> question, uh, Richard Harling is asking, given the breadth of possibilities available in post-production, to what extent do you rely on capturing the look in camera? And how does that add to the quality of the actor's performance, your photography, and to the audience experience? Um, I try to get it on set as much as possible. You know, I try to really, if I'm really wanting warm light, to come through the windows. I mean, I put warm light coming through the windows. Um, you know, there's things that are just difficult to kind of chase down in DI. Like if there's an offset between warmth and cool, the sky is cool and you have warm light coming in, you want to light with that offset. Um, and Pi, there's a big warm light that's uh, coming across the um, uh, the water for the scene. But it, it's also helped by a little bit of this cool uh, fill light that's the that I surrounded everything with as well. That it just grounds the warmth for me a little bit more, feels more like sunset. So for me, I get it as close as I can to on set and, and we just push it even farther in DI. And it also helps when you see, editorial is gonna change where things, placements of scenes are sometimes. Sometimes things get just moved around. So say in a script you're going in a certain order and this little section gets moved kind of in the middle 
that may base your color temperature through line a little bit. So, so things sometimes do change in editorial as well. So it, there's a little bit of a mixed bag there. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, now, I do definitely want to speak to you about HDR, like we talked about, and maybe some of your monitoring practices. But before we get to that, uh, we have to talk about how you got to choosing the camera for the particular project. So I know at some point you were running camera tests and you had multiple cameras, uh, probably one of every make uh, on a vehicle rig. Uh, All right. So can you talk a little bit about that and, and sort of the process behind that and, and what the what your findings were? I mean, again, I think you, you probably put together the entire camera suite from a rental house. <laughs> I mean, it's usually what I do. I try to like test all cameras, you know, against each other that I think are, you know, applicable. Um, and I put those all out. I think there's a picture of me. Um, you know, this 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 silly test was. Um, I got tired of of you know you setting each camera up, and then you are shooting them, and then you, and then you, and then the last camera has the best light because it's sunset and looks amazing. And then you go, wow, that looks amazing. That last camera you shot. And I go, yeah, of course, it was the end of the day. And so I didn't want to have any any of that nonsense. I wanted all cameras rolling at the same time. I wanted them rolling on uh, Upper Grand in Los Angeles in the daytime. I, I want to up, do Upper Grand at nighttime. And I've done this run. It's like a run I do with since Benjamin Buttons. So I have, I could go back in my camera log and kind of even put other cameras in that situation too. But I really wanted this test to be projected on a big giant 60 foot screen and really just kind of look at all the cameras and then take the labels off them and really just pick, you know, what is what is good for this movie. And this movie also had some limitations. There's a scene in the movie um, and I know I needed a camera that had high sensitivity. And, you know, in the digital market, that's still kind of, it still trumps kind of everything right now. Um, there was a space shuttle, and I knew if I shot that on film, I'd have to put, you know, it's the, the platform is 500 foot tall. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but it seems like it's 500 foot tall. Um, and there was no condor to get above to make a moonlight back to make this kind of a moonlight feel. So my choice would be have ground lights on the ground backlighting. Well, that would have given a heroic feeling that I didn't want for that movie. It wants to be a tower that's being taken apart. So storyline wise, I really wanted to use the practicals that were on. The, in fact, I turned off 75% of them and it felt like I could even turn off another, I felt like I only needed 5% on there. I felt like there's still way too many lights on there. Um, but I felt like that told the story. And so we picked cameras a little bit based on that as well. And I think we have a shot of the actual tower you're referencing, right? Uh, this image here that's oh, up no, on the screen. Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's actually oh, a, no. Real, a, real, a real location. This was just a... Oh, sorry. That was a... Um, they were supposed to be in this environment that I wanted to... It's a real interactive environment. So I wanted to surround them in an environment that was um, swirling around with the media that they were supposed to be watch watching. So the editors came up with a, um, an edit, and I put that edit on the screen, and that was their environment they were in. Of course, things, of course, they so, changed that too. <laughs> right. And then back to those uh, shots of the, you know, the camera test. You had obviously film cameras. You had uh, a lot of, uh, you know, digital cinema cameras. And ultimately, we know that the the project went with uh, a Sony F65s. So, and right. was that to some of the findings? I'm sure, you know, or you know, were there any sort of uh, thoughts behind that? Um, it was it was a little. It was a lot to do with low light, you know, that I needed for the movie. Um, and that Tomorrowland had a futuristic look on one hand. And, you know, Brad really wanted to do film. In fact, there was a bunch of cameras that was thought about doing digital for Tomorrowland. And, but it just didn't, it just didn't, didn't work. Um, uh, I didn't, you know, and then there was multiple units going. And then it was like, how do we, it, it just became the camera package was like this, this Excel sheet that looked, just was driving me nuts. And I just said, like, listen, uh, I just did some scenes in, in both and I was able to kind of recreate it. I mean, IMAX was 15 perf, pretty amazing, I gotta say. Right. <laughs> but 
practicality of that, it was, uh, was not. I mean, seeing IMAX shot at night and underexposed three stops was kind of interesting seeing um, giant grain, but, you know, devoid of color because it was so underexposed. It was an interesting look. I mean, I don't know. But, you know, the night was... <laughs> <laughs> it was a different, maybe a different movie for that kind of look. <laughs> and then uh, moving uh, back to what we were talking about earlier with, with HDR. So once you knew it was an HDR project, did that change anything about how you exposed or how you monitored on set? Or did you kind of keep your sort of best practices from previous projects you worked I, on? I made, uh, you may avoid certain types of situations, you know, general for HDR. You know, any sort of high contrast panning, you may just want to think about that a little bit, you know. Um, those are kind of the big ones for me. Just like, you know, as far as, you know, if you know something's going to go HDR or what the HDR's problems are, or if it is a problem, like how am I going to go about fixing it? You know, whether it's lowering the contrast of, of that specifically area or lowering the brightness of the shot, or I don't know, experiment some more about trying to figure out how to fix that, you know, in HDR. Because you just don't want it to be, because strobing on a, if it's on a phone, it's probably not a big deal, but if it's on a big screen, it is a big deal. So that's also your kind of, you know, what your target resolution is. You know, your target um, audience viewing experience is also, it's also a little bit different. Right, and you mentioned that earlier, which is why, generally speaking, you'll always go in for a uh, HDR pass and then a 14 foot yeah. Lambert pass and, and then a home cinema release. I mean, even Life of Pi came up with an HDR pass um, and, you know, three years after the fact, and I went in for a special grade for that one. So, uh, you know, I'll try to be there as much as I can, you know. Yeah, I was about to ask you that. So do you try to always go back to, if they were to do that, or if they were to remaster something, or you always try to be available for that? Or I always try to be available and be invited, you know. So I try to work around my schedule, and I'll go there at midnight if I need to, to wherever it is to be part of that. Okay. And, uh, and just, you know, sometimes even like there was an upscaling too that I saw like there were some issues on. So you can call that like if things just feel synthetic, you know. And that's for me is lighting as well. You know, if lighting starts to feel artificial or synthetic, I you know I start over. You know, and I, I've been on set and I go like, man, sometimes this plan is is not good right now. We need to rethink about this and then. You know, come up with a solution, and hopefully, you know, you have a good crew, which we we did, um, and then we can um, go from there. Why is? Oh, sorry about that, guys. My phone is not dinging. I have it off. Oh. Well, anyway. Is there a uh, an example of an instance where you, you had to basically start over from scratch that you can speak to that you know you're like like you just mentioned you looked at a lighting setup you go nope this isn't going to work for our needs. Um. Hmm. Most things work, but yes, uh, let me think of one. Uh, well, you know, for instance, I mean, like a little bit playing chicken on Life of Pi with all those candles, and I had the gaffer add all those, all those lights out there, and it just started feeling so phony. You know, it felt it started feeling like it had all these little special lights out there, and I thought all those special lights were so unspecial to me. You know, I'd just rather just have what just looked best was just the candle glow. And... And uh, we did have them out there, but I, you know, and, and a couple of them I, we couldn't get in time. So, I mean, in DI, I'm like, you know, trying to darken them down a little bit, you know, and try to make them like not as obvious as they, they kind of were. Because, you know, you're just, you know, you're not, some of the sets you're, you can't pre-light the day before. You're kind of in there at night and you're kind of looking at it in the context of all these candles and how much light am I really getting off these candles? And those are a little bit of kind of unknowns. And you kind of get on there today and you go like, uh, let me just be a little scared and add these dumb lights. And it was, those were, it just was a stupid idea. So, I mean, not dumb, it was better to turn it off, to have it than turn it off than the other way around, right, I guess. Um, right. Jeff, we have a couple of questions regarding lighting. Sure, please. Alex Wolver would like to ask, I would love to learn how you break down a seam do you start with a wide shot and then go tight? Do you relight faces as you go for the tights or leave it as it was in the wide? And what is the uh, overall approach? And how do you keep on schedule when working with a meticulous director like Fincher? Oh, I like, 
I mean, I personally like blocking and getting the wide shot done and figuring out where everyone's going to go. Uh, I like doing that because it kind of helps a little bit with lighting. And then we kind of when you get into close-ups, then if someone needs a little cosmetic help or just a little bit of bounce, then we just kind of we're augmenting from that point of view, you know. And also for for Fincher, he likes kind of figuring it out a little bit in the wide shot. My experience, I mean, I haven't worked with him in a while, so. Um, Eric Messerschmidt probably is a better person to ask <laughs> Fincher about that. But um, I do feel um, that makes sense. Then he, you, and even Joe, you know, we kind of figure out the blocking of the wide shot, and then we figure out, it just helps us understand the scene sometimes a little bit more if we're struggling with a little something, and then we kind of come in for tight close-ups. Um, I also try to figure out what the drama is of the scene. You know, there's a... Oh, shit, I can't talk about that movie. Um, <laughs> there's a scene I want to say, but I can't talk about it. Wow. Well, all right. Um, anyway, there's a scene that you're playing dark and it's night and you want to feel like it, this is going to work. Like, is this scene going to play off his device? You know, and I just want to know if it will play off his device and without any other supplemental lighting. Uh, like a street light coming from outside or anything, you know, so we just have, you know, a background. And so I had a feeling like I may want to add something, but it was just so beautiful to play in the silhouette. And just, you know, when he brings up his phone device, that it, the light from there. Yeah, usually I kind of back up to what's right, I think, you know. I'm trying to figure out what I did that was really terribly wrong. I'm sure there's there's many of times I do that. Um, can't uh, think of right. Related to this, uh, Pat Whitehead is asking. I'm going to sort of interpret his question a little bit because the direct question is, how can you get a dark, mushy image while upholding image integrity? I think also that part of that conversation is, when do you know with a specific camera sensor how much light you can give it before? your dark images start to fall apart and you don't have room to work with it in post. Oh, I see. Um, I mean, I do a lot of testing and I have uh, a big monitor on set. Uh, I've seen some, I've been, I've been in some sets and I've seen some people light with these little tiny monitors and I find that um, depending on a, on a big scene, large scene or for a big giant movie, I find that kind of, uh, well, I don't know. I found out how do you how do you know? But I have you know I have on set I have uh, an X three hundred, and I use that, um, and I can see instantly in the toe end when it starts falling apart. So if I start seeing it falling apart, it is falling apart. So I don't either. I start bringing out lights to help that situation if it's, or I take the you know the Sony Venice. You could take the twenty five hundred ASA. That seems to work pretty good. Um, just so uh, we're clear on that one end, when you're working with the X300, you're working in an SDR environment? No, I, I work in standard, yeah. Okay, and is yeah. that with a LUT applied, or are you looking at the log feed out of the camera and evaluating with monitors or with uh, the waveforms? I have, a log, I have a log feed that I can evaluate, but I'm not. that's a terrible thing to light to, so I don't like to. I like to, like, it's a modif slightly modified 709 feed. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for those questions. That was great. Um, moving ahead a little bit, because uh, we obviously want to do, do want to get to Top Gun at some point today, too. But uh, I know for um, Only the Brave, I think this is fascinating for me when you uh, were testing, because for those that haven't seen it, of course, it's about the wildfires in California. Uh, and there was a fire, of course, being, I'm sure, a lighting element, but also a character in the movie, too. So you did some pretty thorough testing of fire rigs and apparatus uh, with your team. So can you talk a little bit about that, that process and sort of what, what you guys were looking for when you were essentially lighting up the desert and fire? Right. I mean, fire was a big, um, you know, character obviously in that movie. And not all cameras can capture the highlight roll off. This was, this was just kind of a fire test. It wasn't really done with the proper camera, but, and this is also very, Bitty, but what I'm looking for in the fire characteristics for a camera is just how the highlight roll off is. So some cameras are really great, you know, at zero to sixty or zero to seventy, but 
the highlights get chicklety or they get just, I don't know, they feel unnatural. So I'll test all cameras against and see how that highlight roll off is. Um, knowing that this is a particular, this is a giant character of the movie. And so here's us testing um, propane. We're mixing some diesel in here to see like how rich the black smoke is. So we're just kind of looking at this footage right now just to kind of see. And that's a, that's a, I think it's a 30 foot wall right now. And on, this, on the day we had, I think we had six of those along with trees that we would set also. Um, there's a, a little tree stand that also put out flames as well. I think some days we were burning, you know, 3,000 gallons of propane a day with some diesel. Yeah. <laughs> not, not so environmentally friendly, yeah. Right, and then, um, so obviously low light was probably not a challenge. So as far as ASA and whatnot for that, you were probably it's sticking It's the highlight that. that's a challenge for some cameras that I found, you know, and I did do, I did put not quite, I put a fire for that test. I specifically put a, a bunch of different fires across and I put six cameras across, oh, no, not six, four cameras across, and I just tested all of them against each other. And some cameras sung, some cameras didn't, and we just kind of chose the ones that would suit the whole movie for us. And then I guess your sort of next project after Only the Brave was, uh, wasn't necessarily a feature film, but this is when you uh, actually went to Japan and you were in instrumental in helping Sony come up with the Venice uh, camera. Right. Right. So you, you, you went there, and you know, what is it like to, to be basically designing the camera of your dreams? Like, what was that trip like? Oh, <laughs> you know, Sony was really interested in listening to me on a, on a, on a design level for the Venice. Um, you know, so I was really glad to have, you know, their ear on this, which I think was just, and they, they, they were, I didn't think they would listen, but they'd listen. And I, you know, the, the end, you know, I was kind of responsible. I wanted all the NDs to be in the camera. So I thought, wouldn't this be great to be able to judge the depth of field on the fly? Because as I said before, you know, I feel like depth of field is a character. So if I could slide back and maybe get that two shot just in or get it more in or look at the depth of field as I'm playing with a shot rather than having ACs flying in or going in big giant leaps, you know, I, I didn't. So I like the idea that I can go in one-stop increments and really fine-tune as an idea uh, and have them all the way go up to N2.4. And so I thought that was r really important. And also I wanted, um, I wanted to have uh, controls on my side. So that little window we kind of talked about on my side so I can change the NDs as I'm looking at it rather than go to the, the other side and do that. I said, I'm just as important as well. I want to ding dongs. I want to be able just to kind of go there and roll it myself. Um, so I had, uh, I was instrumental on, on that decision. And the Rialto mode kind of came across another need a little bit after the fact is that I wanted to get it in uh, the F1 of the shot over. Um, but it turns out when they built this uh, device, that it was a small little sensor on the end of this, um, you know, nine foot rope that allowed us to put the sensor anywhere we wanted to, you know? So it was, we go like, this was initially made for the jet, but this could be really useful for, you know, I mean, on commercials, I've used it for handheld. I've used it to, you know, stick on the end of a pole. Uh, it's, um, you know, actually, this is actually in the movie, so I could talk about it. I think there's a, a motorcycle shot with Tom on it, and you just put the light camera out there. It's not a big, giant camera at the end of the his motorcycle. So, um, yeah, that that really uh, that was really uh, instrumental for that all that yeah. stuff. So, um, and you mentioned earlier already uh, the dual native ISO, the fact that you have a 2500 ISO mode too, and and the short called the dig uh, that you. Uh, you filmed well, really illustrates some of the uh, low light. Yeah, I wasn't there yet. <laughs> 25 wasn't in uh, our cameras were so new on the dig, 2500 wasn't around. The ASA really wasn't totally around yet. Um, but we did shoot it in the you know, 
as wide open as I can with, we shot with um, master anamorphics with front and back uh, flare elements in them. Um, so, but now I can make a, you know, a better dig with 2500. It was, you know, those cameras were so new at the time, you know, they were not, they had little computers on them just to kind of get them to kind of run, you know, they were really kind of mostly there, you know, but, uh, you know, the sensor and color science was all kind of there, but, um, and I think I'm pretty proud of the way the dig looks. I think it looks great. Um, I think, you know, I approached Sony that, I felt like we really need to have, you know, like a series director direct like a, a series piece and, you know, to show off the uh, the capabilities of this camera. So we kind of, me and Joe kind of came together and uh, made right. this uh, the dig. Yeah, we have a couple of photos of that as well for those that haven't seen it. Uh, you know, there's obviously some daytime stuff, which of course is really challenging, especially when you're shooting in a desert inside a car. Right. And there's also some of the scenes where they're in the office building at night when they break into the offices. And uh, what I didn't realize was that your cameras were so early in the build that they were before the 2500 uh, ASA mode. But, you know, you could have fooled me because it's so clean, you know, the, the way those dark, really mm -hmm. sort of uh, dark scenes looked and, you know, lit with what seemed like the practicals on the computer screen, for example. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, obviously, a lot of what you uh, learned and what, sort of you advice you gave Sony on building it, you know, translated to uh, Top Gun. You know, I think most of us have probably already seen the behind the scenes. You know, obviously you should watch a trailer if you haven't, because that's a lot of energy. But there's a fantastic behind the scenes too that maybe we can roll up a short part of right now uh, that shows some of the work that you did to put the uh, cameras inside these fighter pilot, you know, fighter jets, you know, filming the, uh, the cast and crew. Uh, so we can roll that right now. I love that shot where his hair gets just blown away from the... <laughs> We're working with a brand new camera system. Yeah, so there we see some of the Venices and Rialtos inside. So how many cameras did you have total inside the cockpit? We had six. Oh yeah, there so there's a six shots. And that was for coverage reasons, right? To get all the angles that you needed? Right, correct. We have four looking back and, and two front. Sure, jet fuel. And that's cool, you get the vapor trails coming up the wing. Yeah, and that was the best thing we ever saw, like vapors coming off. I thought that was so great to get that in camera. We just, I mean, this whole job was like a big challenge to try to, we really wanted to get it, you know, it all in camera, all the aerials and just, you know, that was our goal. How do we get these cameras in the jet? Um, you know, I had uh, ideas about cameras and how we can get them all in and just convincing the Navy and kind of planning and doing some prep with some other jets um, to kind of show what my ideas are and to get that approved through the Navy. And I, and I really was, this is a thing, you know, you have to, when you're dealing with potentially another department like the Navy or, or someone that's not quite, you know, movie industry, you really want to give yourself a lot of leeway time. So in the in the beginning, when I first got the job, I said, let me talk to the Navy, <laughs> you know, let me get my contacts up. Let me figure out how to get in there. Let me figure out like early on, almost before I'm even hired, like how do I, um, you know, I know it's out there, but how do I, what will you allow me to do, you know? And, um, you know, and it took a lot of, you know, they told me in the beginning, says, you'll never get six cameras in there. You know, they said, you'll never get six cameras. And I said, well, let me let me try. You know, so I sat there by the jets as they were like, as we're putting them in. And I kept on saying, you know, what is that part for? I said, no, that's a video camera. I said, uh, for looking at our missile, you know, whatever it is. And I go like, well, you don't need that, right? I mean, this we're just, <laughs> I got my cameras. <laughs> I was like, can I just take that spot? And it says, uh, yeah, sure, you, you don't need it. So I just kept on like finding things they didn't, you know, obviously everything for safety for them flying. And I just kept on questioning them, you know, just because you got to know, because I got to know right in the beginning, like no way you might get two cameras in there. I mean, I just, for me being, an, I, I feel like me being a little bit persistent. I feel like I got my way a little bit there, you know, just to be like a little bit just, you know, it's okay to keep on questioning or, or find the right person. I, I, I um, so there's a shot, um, I think in the beginning, Top Move, there's a very famous, I think, uh, dialogue about turning the boat for the sun. 
and it became a kind of a big deal. And you know, I was, everyone I was talking to, I said, Lo I'd love to be sun to be heading, you know, like the nose heading to like four o'clock. And I said, can we just? And everyone was saying, no, no, you, you can't do that. And and I was kind of walking down the hallway, and, and I just passed. Uh, someone, he says, well, how's your day going? I said, man, I just really wish I could have got the sun like at the right angle. It would have made the shot just so much better. And he goes like, well, that's not a problem. This, you know, our ship has 23 years of fuel. We can go anywhere you want. We can, and we can make our own wind. And I go like, and then I just said, well, you know, he says, what do you need? And I go, well, I'd love to have the sun, you know, at four o'clock at about you know, six, you know, heading four o'clock, about six o'clock. And he, uh, I was almost in tears, like, the whole boat like started moving over. It was like perfect. The sun was perfect. And then from then on, I had this carte blanche of like, I could just turn this aircraft carrier wherever I want for the sun. And I just called him my best gaffer I've ever had. <laughs> it was awesome. That was, that is something, man. It was just like when you just could turn your whole world around and just have everything lined up perfectly. You know, I do some coverage of one shots. I said, yeah. And then he'd be right next to me <laughs> from then on. He was like, he was my right hand person. And I said, okay, <laughs> we're going to the other side. Let's flip the sun. And we boat would turn. And that oh, was amazing. Yeah, really good. <laughs> Does he have to become a good, union member? Good now? moments. Huh? <laughs> Just, I was making a joke that he has to become a union member now. Uh, because ah, he's... yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know, man. It was, it was awesome. That was great. Really great. Really yeah. exciting. Now, you know, a lot of the stuff, too, with this, and what we started seeing a little bit is, you know, you, you have coverage. So you have the cameras in the cockpit for all the coverage that you need. And then you also have uh, ground, you know, base crews like we saw also, and also right. air-based crews, too. And and you touched upon it a little bit uh, briefly about... And we also the, have ex external mounts. Oh, so on the jets themselves. Right. On the jets themselves. So there's external mounts on the jets. Um there's, uh, we had ground-based teams on mountains, various mountains capturing runs. We had um, the Cine jet, uh, which was capturing a, a lot of footage. Um, and uh, yeah, we had some days we had, yeah, that's the Cine jet. <laughs> Jeff, we have a question. Sure. Uh, there's a couple of grips who are curious about the rig in the cockpit, specifically the six camera. Uh, they wanted to ask, were there any special uh, considerations that had to be made to mounting them in there, considering vibration, uh, shake being introduced to the cameras from vibrations of the fuselage, any of that, and also keeping aerodynamics? I think it's uh, specifically to the uh, shots inside the cockpit, those are the POV uh, cameras. All right. Well, there's no aerodynamics on the inside. There was definitely cameras I wanted to put on the exterior that were... Um, aerodynamic issues. Um, so I didn't get those places. Uh, um, and there were some ones that were on the top uh, looking back uh, that had to be a special housing that took a lot of engineering to get those housings made. So um, those were difficult. But you know, when I did my test in the L30 line, they were all hard, all hard mounts. I didn't need any stabilization. I think if I did get vibration, I'd want more, you know what I mean? So I don't want like less stabilization. Um, our tolerance is because for safety reasons, um, the actor has to have, be able to eject. So there's a whole like line from that has to be completely cleared. So we had to even shave off part of the lenses to make sure that not even an eighth of an inch was sticking out beyond the shield. And because an F-18 has a bar that comes in the middle um, between them, we had that tolerance to deal with as well, because that had to be clear. Uh, if the canopy has to eject and the canopy has to lift off, all the wires have to be cleared. Um, and I, we had some breakaway cables for some of the cables that were mounted to the canopy. So, uh, you know, that all had to be considered. So um, there's, exp there's pyro that, that, um, that blows the canopy and, and, and there's also underneath the seats that all has to be considered in camera placements and body placements of um, uh, of the cameras. So the deck was manufactured by uh, the, we had a platform, which was a hard mount um, where all the cameras were kind of placed. And 
I basically adjusted the actors. The seat was allowed to go up and down. So some actors were taller, some actors were shorter, but I just, we just, we just, I went up before everyone flew. I just kind of found out their limit, their range and limitations. We found out their depth of field we need to go. I looked kind of where they were flying to guess the exposure because we had to guess the exposure because we couldn't, it, it's, we didn't do auto exposure. Um, and I, I don't like auto exposure. I like things going up and down. So I didn't want anything chasing it anyway. So, um, you know, and I guess probably, I did probably 90, 98 percent probably right on the exposure we'd look at the clouds and we say yeah it looks cloudy over there they're going into the canyons we look at 3d maps of the canyons they're about to go in to say how deep they're going to go what the shadow angle is about that time how shadow the you know what part of the mission would be in the in the darkness so we just the uh, the focus the um depth of field and and the height in relation to cameras before each flight So, um, you know, we haven't really started talking too much about this, but I know on some of those uh, follow, you know, especially the Cinejet, you, you were probably dealing with a gimbal of some sort, like a shot over. Um, and I'm curious, part of your choice as a DP when you get in a project is, what do you think about lensing? Like, how do you test that as well? Like, you know, obviously we saw your camera tests, but what's your process like when you think about lensing and what's the right lens for a project or a scene or, you know, how does that work for you when you break down a scene and a, or a script? I mean, Top Gun, probably if I showed you that list of lenses that we had on the thing, it's, it's a page. And then they're all for different reasons. You know, we had, you know, the 75 to 400 with a doubler for, you know, on top of mountains. So that would be a pack package they would take, you know, with, you know, the 25 to 300 from time to time. And the they were all just depending on what they were doing. You know, I do. I didn't know I wanted some wide shots of it blowing up a mountain, so we didn't want it to be, you know, at the 400 end of that. Um, we did want some close proximity, uh, depending on what the who the pilots were, what the limitations of the ground were. Um, that kind of determined which lenses and zooms kind of went out there. All the ground air had to be kind of zooms. It had to be flexible. They were light units that kind of went up to these different mountains. It couldn't be like a bunch of primes going out there and guessing you know i just that didn't work but we were on the ground um you know shooting scenes you know we did a lot um uh, we shot a lot with sigma primes we shot a lot with um master we did some master primes on the on focal length 75 on up and i used them at full frame and i even liked how they didn't it didn't quite work i thought that kind of did not work in a good way um uh i tested some i think we got the Fuji full frame, we had it for a little short term time. Yeah, you had the pre-mistas, right? They, they, those were when the pre-mistas were first being introduced, yeah. basically, and, and you were able to get your hands on uh, probably yeah, one or two. Yeah, a very short time. time. Shame on Fuji for that, you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yanked it after I started liking it. Um, anyway, so... Um, Was that the, the longer lens, the 85 to 300? Uh, sorry, the 80 to 250 pre-mista that you were using, or...? He had the 80 to 350, and I think, and I also had a little bit of uh, time with the other one as well, but all just, you know, too short to get like a whole rhythm with it. So, um, and a lot of times, you know, we did want it to be at my normal, you know, shallow self, you know, so I did, we did some stuff with mostly on primes and shell depth of field for a lot of the interior work. And for the shot of a rig, you probably had to use uh, zoom lenses there too for practicality reasons as well. So I think you, I think practicality, you used the yeah. Cabrio series for the 85 to 300 and maybe even the 20 to 120. Uh, did you mainly go we wide used, or were you? Yeah, mainly we used both those lenses and for different missions. So sometimes we go up the the 85 to 300 for for like some stacking missions or to give sometimes more speed with the ground speed kind of be, behind it. And so we use those for different reasons. This is my test of what would fit. I made this little this silly chart of what would what would fit in the camera, and you know that was kind of the invention of the Rialto that would kind of work with this 25 to 300. Kind of initially why it was made, but yeah. threading it through the F1 was a little bit difficult. Uh, but I found that if I just we went specific missions, we could be really specific about which primes we went up with. Are, do you find yourself primarily using zooms, or are you kind of uh, sort well, of? Well, like I said before, I mean, like I, you know, like in the air, or just you know, when you're doing air to air, I think zooms are pretty critical, you know, to try to get the shot. Um, but on ground, when I'm you know doing intimate scenes, I'm kind of on primes for that. I mean, you, you know, it is not, you know, I'm able to set the shot, 
you know, here's A, here's B, we're, we're blocking. But with planes, you know, <laughs> it's a little bit different story. You're kind of grabbing and you're, you know, there's a little bit of different kind of finessing on the fly, you know, that they did. Right, and um, not to take this conversation to a completely different direction, but you had mentioned when we had spoken earlier that you think as far as production, you know, with, with COVID safety in mind, uh, that you, you're starting to think that Zooms are going to be really important to how film sets work these days. Oh, uh, maybe. Um, yeah, I don't know. I It could. It could make things easier. I mean, I just, I actually shot, you know, this little thing and I, you know, I used, and I was getting late at night and I had to use some primes, you know what I mean? So I just feel like, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to take anything out of the bag. I think everything has to be kind of looked at per situation. I mean, there's definitely situations where Zoom can definitely help you out. And, you know, the 1885 is one lens that gets you down to a T2, which I think is definitely nice for depth of field, you know, that you can kind of get nice depth of field with. Um, but, you know, everyone has to have their own look, you know. I mean, there's anamorphics and there's just, you know, there's, you know, everyone's not going to require, a, you know, a zoom look. There's a lot of primes out there that give you different looks that may be right for your project. And I think, I think you have to look at what you're doing and apply, you know, this is the look I'm going, whether it's flary or anamorphic or these horrible, you know, these old kawas or whatever you want to get involved with that have these kind of barrel distortions and focus breathing, like, you know, and you may want that as a story point. That's got to be, you got to, you got to determine your lens on that. So I, I hope with this COVID that we don't, we're not losing the craft and, you know, our end goal about making beautiful images, you know, I really, you know, that we're allowed to kind of screw it up a little bit. We're allowed to kind of you know, use uh, aberrations as an expression, you know. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and then I have, I have a personal question that's uh, a little bit on topic, but it was mainly the idea that you have a classic film like like Top Gun or, or Tron, and you uh, are shooting now, of course, Top Gun Maverick. You know, what is that like when you are thinking about, you know, your work, your style versus looking at, say, Jeffrey Kimball from the original Top Gun or even Bruce Logan from the original Tron? Like, do you put little homages into these previous DPs or, uh, you know, are you just sort of taking it and saying, this is my story now? <laughs> no, I talked to Kimball a little bit, you know, I spoke with him and, you know, funny enough, you know, part of the reason why I, I, um, I took, you know, Top Gun is that, you know, I, I worked with Tony Scott on three movies. So I did, you know, Crimson Tide as a gaffer. Um, I worked with uh, him on the fan and I did enemy of the state. Um, the first two with with Derek Wolski and the last one was with Danny Mandel, um, who are, have been really kind of great pushing me forward as well. Um, so those were a lot of reasons why I did um, Top Gun. You know, I felt I don't know very um, personal about it um, in some ways. Then I and I really wanted to do a good job, you know, for Tony and you know. So I, I don't know. I have a little bit of a, a soft spot for that whole. Feeling, um, uh, but yes, I did want it. There is some, there is some nods definitely to Tony and uh, the way it was shot, and to um, Jeffrey Kimball as well. That's great. Um, I believe we have a couple of questions from our audience as well, so I'll make sure we leave some time for that. So, uh, Ian, if you have anything that you want to jump in on, please do. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, David Rudd would like to ask. Can you talk about your early days as a gaffer and cameraman in the music video days and how that shaped you as a cameraman, all the experimentation, art, and risk taking? Um, music videos. Some were great, you know, some were obviously not. Um, <laughs> they're a different animal. I mean, I, you know, I started off, did, I did a lot of, um, you know, rap videos in the very beginning. And, and it was such a different world because I was gaffing for Fincher and, you know, I did all these. So it was a different world for me, that whole thing, uh, as far as shooting. I mean, I did gaff a lot of uh, music videos with Fincher in the past, but this whole mindset was a little bit different. And uh, they seemed to like me and they kept on hiring me over and over again. Um, but sometimes experimentation 
I'm not sure how experimentation was on that, or how that helped me. Interesting. It didn't help as much as I thought it would, because um, it's really a different thing. It's. Um, I like to say where I could experiment on much. I mean, I did the. I did a commercial for Fincher, which was probably the ugliest thing I've ever done. I mean, he probably wouldn't mind me saying that either. Um, I did this Orville Redenbacher, which was like a thing for. Um, anyway, you can look that up. It was the worst thing I ever shot. Um. <laughs> 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 but um, anyway, uh, I don't know. I think you look at each project and figure out how you can do the best for the project. So the music videos have a definitely, like, that's a different thing. You have to be fast. You have to be creative. You have to be, how do you make something new out of it? Um, so, you know, definitely I like to be fast on set as well. So I think I'm fast, you know. Sort of related to that, there's another question uh, from Chris who's asking, uh, did you find the transition from set lighting to camera especially difficult? If so, how do you work past that and speed up your trans transition? Uh, it kind of put me a lot to kind of figure out shots in, in previs, so I kind of, it kind of figure out camera angles and uh, so that kind of, that that seemed to help, you know, I, on Benjamin Buttons, because I was, you know, definitely very early on in my career, I spent, a, I made these books, uh, this lookbook in the very beginning that I gave Fincher, and I just went with a still camera into the Nolan house and just shot all these different angles and different kind of lighting situations and uh, what I felt kind of worked and did not work, just kind of on my own. I just had my own little couple days, just, I don't know, by myself, just figuring it out. Um, and Previs kind of helps me figure it out as well, just to kind of previsualize and get an idea, and I kind of figure what camera angle is working, what lenses are working. This seems to work better long, it seems to work better short. Um, along, those, along those lines, uh, we're being asked, is there any Previs tools that you particularly like to use? I think this is in regards to software. Oh, software? I mean, my crew works in Vectorworks. Um, so I found that Cinema 4D takes in Vectorworks because I don't find Vectorworks lighting all that great. And since I want to also play with lenses and lighting, I kind of use uh, Cinema 4D for that. And I find it fast and I find it pretty in intuitive. Um, that's what I use, but I I'm sure there's other things that other people can use. I, th I find those other ones, uh, those other ones are just way too complicated for me. And I don't, and I, what I do a lot for movies, I get the sets, which is I'm actually getting now, and I'm working on a, um, a project that's coming up, uh, hopefully we'll shoot soon. Um, and we're working out, I'm working out skylight placements, you know, I'm lighting the sets and figuring out, does this skylight need to be bigger, smaller, move it to the left, move it to the right, because it takes place a lot of uh, skylights in the scene. So I'm just trying to make sure that in previs, I can kind of get an idea before they build it and we're stuck with it that I'm getting what I want. So that's what I use on my own previs. And I kind of just tinker around by myself for a little bit, just really figure out camera angles. And, and I send something and I'll send it to the director and I'll say, hey, does this kind of make sense? Where um, does this make sense? And then he'll say yes or not. Uh, to that end, we have another question. And that is, um, how did you how do you establish your relationship with a director, and how would you recommend young directors find some photographers to work with consistently? Uh, wow. Well, well, I guess people want to know about people ask me about like how I got started, but the way I got started was probably not the best. I mean. I had a friend who just you know he was just into drugs and then he he got fired and then he hired me and then I then I took his place in this being a stage manager and then I was working for a gaffer who was also doing tons of drugs and then I was his, his, his electrician and then the, I was covering him so often that basically I just the direct the, the the DP just called me instead so I guess in a way my the way I moved up was just a lot of people's poor choices of drugs I guess um, and then I just kind of landed the job. So I, that introduced me to Derek Wolski. So I did um, 
you know, I did the crow with Wolski. I did um, uh, Crimson Tide and the fan with Wolski. And I did tons of commercials and we just hooked it off. We hit it really, really well. And then from then on, I met Harris and I did gaff some movies for Harris. So I kind of, in the beginning, I kind of took those two, uh, you know, people that really helped me out there and, and their ideas. And I kind of, initially it was a lot about them in my ideas when I kind of did jobs, but then and eventually I kind of found my own place, I feel, which is a little bit different. Um, but that's kind of my start, which is not, and it took a long time, you know, I mean, I started in 80, in the business in 84, and I started shooting in, I mean, full-time shooting in 2000. So a lot of students probably don't want to hear that, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. I mean, I, I had a follow-up question to that, which is, I think you sort of already answered, which is, is there any advice that you would give a young cinematographer starting their career now, uh, aside from getting friends, you know, becoming friends with folks that are making maybe ill-advised choices? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah um, I mean, I just think if, if you could hang around the people you want to shoot for, I mean, do that, you know? Um, I think that would be, that's the best way to kind of get something coming your way. I mean, if you could be, you know, an assistant editor and, and then find your way into, you know, editing a project you want to do for that. Cinematography, some people go through, I've seen people go through the camera, de, um, camera department, whether that's where you, I went through the lighting department, that's a little, I think that's a little more rare. Most DPs seem to go through the camera department. Um, but it is just, you know, it is being, it is being around the people you know you can be and how to get on set, like figure out how to get on set in some sort of form, make a face for you, make people recognize you. Um, even though you may be doing, I was happy in every single one of my positions. I was a happy electrician. I love that job. I was a happy best boy. I love that job. I was a happy gaffer. I was happy and, and, I, and I wasn't miserable in any of these positions and I feel like people just wanted to be around you. So maybe it's good just to be someone who wants to, you know, wants to work with you and be around with you and the, you know, DP hang around with a gaffer that you get along with. I mean, Wolski and I are really good friends and, um, you know, I, you know, I was really good friends with the late Harris, you know, he was, he was a good guy. So I don't know, try to build strong friendships. Great. We have one more question. Uh, Maybe we can fit this in because we're going to get tight on time here. But um, could you describe a time when someone disagreed with your artistic vision and what you would say is the best way to come into a fair agreement? Uh, I guess it depends on why they, um, they, um, Jesus, I'm being invaded. Um, um, I guess, well, I, have ever had a strong disagreement with someone? Yeah, I mean, there was there was a, there was one job I did uh, where me and the director didn't um, hit it off really well. Um, I kind of remember that to this day. He, I, it was hard to tell like if he was joking with me or not, but he said he wanted it to make it look like Jackass the movie, and that was his reference. And I was trying to figure out what that is. Is that just like a lot of handheld and sloppy? You know, is that just sloppy? You know, just yeehaw framing and and i kind of i said well, really that's what you may want to look like so he went into there and i kind of thought with this it wasn't my style but i okay let's go with this frame of mind and then it turned out that he wanted this kind of slow motion it was something else and um yeah that job was a nightmare for me because i was in one gear you know with one set of plans and one way to shoot it and then he wanted this kind of elegant dolly movement and and that was on the day and and he so that was really fronting. And then I realized well, what it was. And again, it was, it was drug related. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm sure there's um, quite a few people out there that are so appreciative of your time with us right now. And one of the burning questions that they're gonna have for you is, what do you look for? What sets someone apart 
without trying to be part of the camera department. Um, I just like the, for me, I just like a good attitude around me all the time. Someone I want to be around, you know, and then sometimes I'll see someone who has like a little bit of a spark and I've been known to kind of from time to time say, hey, can you man this camera for me? You know, um, for me, Eric Messerschmitt was like one of those guys that was a gaffer for me and he's doing really well, but he was one guy I know with confidence. I could say, go off and get that shot for me. And I just know it will be, you know, amazing. So I just feel like he gave me that sense of confidence, you know, so I feel like, and he's doing amazing. I mean, I think that guy is doing amazing work and he, uh, he was my gaffer for very short and I, and I do miss him. <laughs> he had such good dialogue about this, you know, about creation and new ways to light. And he was always very like a spark, like around me. And I just love that spark. I mean, so, and if I can have, you know, you know, right now I'm looking for a gaffer, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then I just need that spark, you know. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for that. And thank you to the folks who submitted those questions. They were all great. Um, and, uh, you know, if anyone wants to drop Claudio a resume, we'll put your email address. In the top <laughs> we won't do that if you don't want that. But uh, no, it's uh, okay. I mean, I, I do got the uh, some people. But yeah, it's all. all, all. Yeah, and, and you know, I think what you said is really resonates true, which is you surround yourself with people that are are like minded but yet challenge you at the same time. So I, I really appreciate that insight. Yeah, there's something to watch out for because sometimes if you go off and they're doing, you know, throw the baby out of the house five or whatever it is like that, and you're surrounding yourself with those people, I mean, don't be surprised if that's what you're you know you're going to find yourself around is that kind of that kind of work. You know what I mean? So. It might be an advent, you know, you might say, wow, I'm, but I'm in. Yeah, but you got to be prepared that that may be, you might be in that, you know. So that's just, it's careful, careful steering. And I still kind of do that. I'm careful about what I do next. Uh, I'm careful about who I work with. Um, you know, I find out resumes, I kind of find out about them. How are they to work with? Are they difficult? And I, I don't really need to work with, I don't want to work with different people, difficult people. I work with, I mean, David is, is, is great to work with. Uh, Ang Lee was great to work with. Joe Kaczynski is amazing to work with. I mean, I seem to be very fortunate to, ha you know, I've at least kept it in a really amazing place of a pool of people to work with. Uh, that's great. And again, thank you so much for your insight and your time. And I think we'll just uh, wrap up today's conversation with one final question, which is a bit of a personal one, which is, what are you watching yourself these days? Uh, you know, especially during, I mean, I know you're busy with DIs, obviously, for Top Gun, but, you know, what are you watching these days and what are you doing to stay creative outside of anything Top Gun related? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? You know what I do? Actually, I've been just at my house making my own dumb music videos with my daughter. You know, that's kind of what I do. She makes music. We kind of play, do things together. I just find some. We had a little rain scene out of my house the other day. I just had a little, you know, I made my own rain and did a little cool light from outside and did this little kind of noir thing. And, you know, I just, for me, I just like messing around at the house with just doing things and shooting little videos every now and then. So just to keep myself a little bit from going stir crazy while we're all employed, you know? Well, uh, again, thank you so much for all of your insights uh, and sharing uh, your, your wisdom with us. And I want to thank you again, Claudio, for, for joining us today for our Creative Forces session. Uh, so you. with that, uh, I think we'll sign off for today. Thank you so much for everyone for tuning in. Uh, this video, of course, will be available on our YouTube channel. And once again, big round of applause for Claudio Miranda for joining us today. So thank you so much. And we will catch you on the next Creative Forces event. Take care. All right. Thanks.